to the Treasure Trove of Curios. I'm Rebecca and today I have got with me Karen. Uh, Karen is someone who I met four and a half years ago. Yep. She moved to the area and we met at a, um, a gathering where the town was trying to organize some funding for a project they wanted to do and so we we're all there to um, support it. So we we're doing a photo to show how many people were behind it. And Karen was there, dressed up in 50s? It was, it was 1950s vintage, and I'd actually only just moved into the area, literally maybe about a week. And yeah, I was used to wearing vintage all the time, and when I heard that there was a, a photo opportunity taking place in town, I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity to meet the people, meet the locals, and um, dress head to toe in vintage. So com complete with a 1950s um, wide brimmed hat. I saw Karen and instantly knew that she was the new person in town because she was dressed so differently to everybody else. We're in a country town and no one was dressed up at all. Except Karen. Yes. And that was an interesting experience that day. So, tell everybody a little bit about you. Well, I had actually relocated from Sydney and I've been here for just over four years now. And at the time I was heavily into vintage and I still am heavily inspired by vintage. Um, I was running a business called Divine Vintage Dresses and I, through my love of vintage, I learned to sew. And I've had numerous exhibitions at our local winery. and Which I've modeled at. <laughs> I'll just add that in there. Yes. <laughs> um, but with the advent of COVID-19, I found that it was difficult for me to continue running the business. Um, you've got when you're sewing and for other people, you've got to be up close and personal and that just hasn't been viable mm. in the current climate. And I was also feeling like I wanted to take the business in a different direction. As much as I loved vintage, I was thinking about, I love designing more. So I started to move away from authentic vintage and I wanted to create my own styles that are inspired by vintage. Mm -hmm. Plus I really love playing with fabric. And <laughs> <laughs> so I've been from playing dress ups to, <laughs> to playing with fabric. So I closed my business. I've closed my business to buy vintage dresses mm -hmm. and I've had, as we all have had, plenty of time to think about where we want to go next in life during the whole isolation lockdown period. Mm -hmm. And I really am passionate about creating, designing and creating gowns. Yep. Um, made to measure, mm -hmm. still with an uh, still vintage inspired, but I want to move away entirely from the buying and selling. Well, I have moved away entirely from the buying and selling of vintage clothing. So, do you want to tell us a bit about that? What you used to do with the vintage items? Yep. So, I started Divine Vintage Dresses through. Um, acquiring vintage for myself to wear then I thought it'd be a great idea to buy and sell so then I started buying up big of all these <laughs> vintage clothes and then they'd get they they'd arrive in they'd arrive at the post office in these big boxes and as I started pulling them out it's, oh that one stinks it smells like cigarette smoke and because everybody <laughs> smoked and <laughs> cigarette burns in the dresses and then tears and holes and rips and and, and I needed to educate myself on vintage and I needed to educate myself in sewing and how to uh, authentically repair hmm. these dresses, and which is, I really love the techniques that were used um, from the 1920s through to the 1960s, early 60s, before things became mass produced. So I know how to sew vintage. Hmm. And I see that as a higher quality than what we can 
than, than what we have in the shops today. Yeah, I mean, what you see in the shops today are mass produced, the seams are all crooked and nothing is the same size. Like you can get three items that are the same design, the mm. same the same item essentially, but are different sizes. Mm. One won't fit you at all. Mm. <laughs> no, and there's a very good reason for that and that's because it's all mass produced. There's no hand cutting involved. It's all machine cutting fabric. Yeah. Fabric moves as the machine comes down to cut it and you know, hence you end up with different sizes. And I actually had, um, when I first started sewing, I was doing alterations for other people and I got to a point where I refused to do alterations to modern garments for that very reason. The quality was, you mm -hmm. found yourself not just doing an alteration, you, it was like you almost had to remake the, the item. So it's frustrating. Yeah, and it was very frustrating and hence why and I... expensive. Yeah. And it's defining the cost of having to right. disassemble the whole thing to start again. Yeah, and I was I found myself in situations where the person paid ten dollars for it on eBay, on eBay, mm -hmm. and and it was brand new, yeah. and and they wanted their alterations to be done for less than that, and I that's my time and 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 yeah. so I. My, my focus was solely on vintage and I absolutely adore vintage because I find, it, I find the eras to be very elegant yeah. um, and like I said the, the quality of the clothing but it's, it's led me to this point and I feel now that I have come so far with my knowledge and my experience in vintage and in sewing that I want the focus to move away from the vintage and into the couture side of things. And hence, I've been educating myself in couture. I've been doing you know, courses mm -hmm. in couture sewing, in French draping, um, French pattern draping, uh, you know, studying vintage patterns and understanding the sewing techniques and I moving forward when we all come out of isolation and life I'm not going to say it goes back to the way that it was before but I'm going to say that we know some sort of normal maybe yeah. Yeah. When, we, when we reach the new normal mm. <laughs> yes. I, I'm really looking forward to creating designing and creating red carpet gowns what an exciting new adventure. Yeah. I really love that. Maybe I'm going to be on the red carpet one day. Well, <laughs> no. Karen, would you make me a dress? Of course I would. <laughs> My muse. I would love that. <laughs> so over the years, I've actually done quite a bit of modelling with Karen mm. throughout her journey of, of vintage dresses and and the exhibitions that she's done. So I've done some live modeling with that as well, but mostly um, the photography side of things, which has yeah. been an excellent experience for me. I've really loved doing that and we've worked together really well yeah. through that, which has made it a, a really enjoyable experience. Yes. So I no longer have divine vintage dresses. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even have a Facebook business page anymore. No, <laughs> but I have changed my name in on Facebook and you can find me on Facebook you can find me on Instagram I'm now known as Karen Marie Couturier <laughs> I will put the link in the description for that for you so if you happen to want some spectacular garment made up for you for some special event or for everyday use because why not then um, contact Karen and she will organize something spectacular for you so, would you like to tell us a bit about the process of making a dress? Absolutely. In fact, you probably can't shut me up. <laughs> I'm, what I've got next to me is a dress that I've almost finished making. Mm -hmm. There are many people out there who would be familiar with the Australian Home Journal magazine. Mm -hmm. And it was a monthly edition that featured free patterns from the 1920s through to the 1970s, I believe. This pattern is actually from December 1941. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and when I started this dress, it was purely an experiment to play around with a 
an Australian Home Journal pattern. I've made a couple of them in the past. I was interested in making another one during, I call it my COVID project. And I was also keen to use this fabric because, oh, going back to what I was saying earlier, I love fabric. So, <laughs> <laughs> so but I'm going to, what I want to highlight in particular are the things that are involved in what I do, the dresses, the the level of detail that I go to. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the fact that the dress, number one, please bear in mind that it doesn't have a zipper in it yet and you can't see the hem but it hasn't been hemmed yet. So it's still a work in progress. It's a work in progress. It's almost finished. All, all of my dresses, I like to make, I like to line my dresses. Mm -hmm. It does make it, it does add to the time because it's almost like you have to have to make two dresses. But this, so this dress is fully lined. So we have silk lining and we have Italian cotton on the outside. All of the finishing to it has been done by hand. So inside here, all of this finishing here, all of this has been hand sewn. Maybe I should bring this over so you can see a bit closer. Mm. So along here, that's all been stitched by hand. And this is pure silk. And this is Italian cotton. Over the shoulder here, there's all these gathers. And inside the sleeve here, I have used sleeve heads to keep the shape of the sleeve. So one of the other things is when you put lining into a, into a garment, so it needs a little hook and eye at the top here, but I, I want to draw attention to the finishing side. So here's our silk, here's our hand stitching, and this You'll see a little row of stitches here, and we put that into dresses so that the lining doesn't roll, and then otherwise you'll be able to see it when you've got the thing closed. Yes, sometimes I feel like it's almost a shame that you can't see the lining because yeah. there's so much work that goes into the lining. And, and really, what you see on the outside, if I would turn the dress inside out, you would see exactly the same thing on the inside. You'd be looking at you'd be looking at a, a silky blue dress. Yeah. Basically. Um, could almost wear it inside <laughs> out. Um, little hand finishes, like this is a little loop for a hook and eye. And it's I might just want to get a closer look at that. It's a hand, this is hand stitched. Now there's going to be a hook that comes across and it will be done up like that at the back. The skirt of this dress has been cut on the bias. This is no easy thing to do. And when you're dealing with a limited amount of fabric like I was for this dress, it becomes even more challenging. Yeah, so skirts cut on the bias mean that every piece of fabric has a horizontal and a vertical weave to it. And when you cut something on the bias, you're actually cutting it on a 45 degree angle to the fabric. And that's what this skirt's doing. So I don't know how easy it is to see, but the grain of this is now going that way and that way. But this presents a whole set of challenges because as soon as you cut your fabric on a 45 degree angle, what you end up with is there's a possibility of the seams starting to become wavy. And then when you have to stitch them together, extra care is required. So. One of the things, one of the challenges I face, I faced with this particular fabric was the fact that it started off like this at the top of the piece of fabric and ended in a very full pattern at the bottom. So you'll see at the back there's a nice flow 
from the top of the dress through to the bottom of the dress. And this particular piece of skirt was all cut in one piece. However, I had a limited amount of fabric. And so what I ended up with was having to piece sections of fabric together so that I could cut the skirt in one piece. But as a result, I've ended up with a huge contrast between the top of the dress and the bottom of the dress, as you can see. Thank goodness for belts. <laughs> because as soon as we put that gorgeous blue velvet ribbon across the waist, it immediately breaks the contrast between the top half and the bottom half. As you can see, there's the beautiful silk lining, also cut on the bias. Again, very challenging to do when working with silk. Silk's just one of those fabrics that's really difficult to work with. And that's probably about all I can tell you about this particular dress. And I'm actually really looking forward to wearing it. So I feel that um, one of the inspirations behind me wanting to pursue the path of couture mm -hmm. was a dress that I created a couple of years ago for Melbourne Cup Spring Racing. It was one of the things that we used to do at our local winery where um, every Melbourne Cup day we'd hold a little event at the winery and I would feature something that I'd created. And this particular dress um, has been featured in Harper's Bazaar magazine and, and and I was so pleased and surprised when they sent me a copy to find out that the dress, not only was it in the centre of the magazine and not all the way to the back, it was also directly, at, it was at the facing page of a Gucci uh, outfit. How exciting. So <laughs> there you have it, you know. So maybe we'll see Gucci and... Karen Marie Couturier. <laughs> <laughs> what fun. Okay, well, I think that's going to bring our little video to an end. So, as I said before, if you have some special event coming up, do allow a bit of time, though, because it does take some time to put together spectacular garments. But if you do have an event that you want to wear a spectacular garment to or some other purpose, then contact Karen. Um, as I said, the link is in the description for her Facebook, and you can contact her from there. So thank you very much, Karen, for being on my little program, and hopefully we will get you as a guest on the program again sometime soon. Thank you, Beth. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> ta <-ra. laughs>